low-tech thing. I'm actually um, guided to be channeled by my mother. So uh, I'm working with my mum. She takes some of the uh, philosophy. Um, well, I thought perhaps in keeping with the theme, the first thing I should do in preparing this talk is to have a look at SEEK and see what it is that people are shopping for when they look for an exploration geoscientist these days. And uh, I have to say that geoscience is a, is a small part of it. That's pretty well assumed. And then there's all the other stuff. First of all, I mean, there aren't many jobs going is the thing that really struck me. But apart from the fact that you're meant to be a wizard geoscientist, you're meant to have commercial and economic awareness, you're meant to manage health, safety and environment, you're meant to interface with the regulators, you're meant to advise on corporate strategy, and I think generally where your undies on the outside. So, in speaking with people who have climbed the greasy pole and are now in better paid exploration roles, I think that they probably feel that they spend, what, less than half the time? maybe 25% of their time on, geo on the stuff they thought they were signing up for when they did their qualification. Mm -hmm. And in their spare time, they're safety advisors, environmental advisors, they're the approvals and tenements manager, they could be the public relations officer, the administrative assistant, mm -hmm. the, the IR coordinator, and sometimes they even, if they can be photographed, they're, they're the corporate image person. <laughs> By way of some local context, and I'll, I'm going to start in WA, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this case because it's, it's fairly <coughs> recent, it was 2012, and I think it captures some of the mood, at least in Australia. I don't think it's limited to Western Australia. And to me, it's quite a disturbing case study. This is a decision that came out of the WA Warden's Court. Uh, from there was an intending uh, bauxite miner who was trying to get some exploration tenements granted in the southwestern part of the state. They had intended to uh, apply for three exploration tenements. They proposed a shallow drilling program and some surface sampling. I should say this is all on public record, so I won't tell any secrets. I have no personal involvement in the project. The land over which they sought tenure was in part uh, state forest and in part uh, a private property, generally about three quarters in, in the, the public land and about a quarter in, in private land. They, there were objections lodged by three individuals uh, on public interest grounds, so they weren't uh, claiming any private injury should the tenements be granted, but they were mounting a, a public interest argument. And the nub of the arguments that they mounted was that first that the land over which the company sought to do exploration was already under stress from environmental factors and other competing land uses, which included things like uh, agriculture, and that in the view of the objectors there were no possible conditions that could be imposed on the exploration license that would adequately protect the environment, tourism, agriculture, and the social well-being of the surrounding community. So they, they not only argued that the land over which the tenement would be granted could not be protected, they argued that the surrounding communities could not be protected, notwithstanding that the exploration would not occur on those properties. The warden's decision recommended that the minister should refuse the tenure. Uh, partly because the warden was sympathetic to one objector's view that according to the uh, objector. Uh, she said, exploration is a natural precursor to mining. I have a problem with that. And therefore, she argued, exploration and mining should be viewed as one. And the warden felt quite comfortable with that. The warden went on to say that in his opinion, that the Mining Act confers an almost unquestionable right for the grant of a mining lease once an exploration lease has been granted. And additionally, the warden said that in his view that even though there are standard uh, environmental conditions generally imposed on exploration licenses that could in a pinch address biophysical impacts, that the warden felt that there was nothing in the standard set of conditions available in WA 
that adequately would address the potential impacts on social surroundings. So, to me, that's 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 quite uh, an important decision, and it's a surprising decision in some ways for it to happen in Western Australia. I mean. One of the things, that if we accept the concept that exploration is the same as mining, I mean, it, you know, reverting to my mum, it was like public hand-holding is the same thing as sleeping with a whole football team. I mean, it's, there, there is something that strikes me as a little odd in that world view. The, but what it does tell us is that access to land and approval decisions are increasingly going to be affected by non-technical considerations. Secondly, what this decision brought home to me is that decision-making authorities, in this case uh, the mining warden, felt no level apparently of discomfort in taking uh, opinions from people on technical matters without really worrying about the bona fides. Uh, the, the people who objected were, there was a person who was a filmmaker, there was a person who ran uh, a tourism venture. They didn't to, to be you know, given credit. They didn't represent themselves as technical experts, but they did express opinions on technical matters, including things like uh, the impact on vegetation, the impact on groundwater. The mining warden took it that because these people lived in the district, that they had some basis for expressing an opinion on technical matters, notwithstanding that they had no technical bona fides. I guess the third thing that this case brought out for me is that the, the focus on social impacts of mining, I think, is on the increase. I, I, you, I, although um, it is not always expressed in those terms, I think increasingly people are prepared to uh, raise the technical or the social issue, and <coughs> if they think that they can't defend it on social grounds alone, it is quite common, I think, to see it represented in the form of a technical argument. I'm thinking vast coal, for example, where there was a technical argument related to groundwater impacts, but in fact, even in the EPA and the Minister's decision, there was a strong whiff of, we think that there are social activities that are fundamentally incompatible with each other. So I think this Darling Range case is an important one by setting the context of the, the mindset within which explorers have to work at the minute. So there are a few themes that I think might be one's non-technical ways for explorers to think that can add value generally to, to projects. I guess the first one is under the general theme of keeping yourself nice. Uh, of all the people involved in projects, I think that uh, explorers are often at the pointy end of uh, interactions with uh, traditional owners and other stakeholders. It's terribly important that explorers understand that uh, native title and heritage are not the same thing. Um, it's a bit like, in one case you're talking about who is my landlord, because ultimately explorers are almost invariably, not, not always, but mostly you are a guest on the land and often your landlord is the traditional owner group or groups. Whereas heritage is more recognising and accommodating the practices. It's if you, in some places you're working, when you go into someone's house, you take off your shoes. So it's, the native title is you must knock on the door, and the other one is you must respect the fact that you don't drink alcohol in that house, for argument's sake. So I guess one of the first parts of keeping yourself nice and adding value is by developing some understanding of the rules around, on one hand, uh, native title and on the other cultural values and heritage. I think it is quite usual to have to deal with multiple and sometimes conflicting stakeholder requirements and I think that's just another element of what explorers are now having to bring to their interactions quite apart from their technical role as geoscientists. Clearly the, the, the consequences of failing to satisfy stakeholder agreements um, can be very significant. Uh, the, the Mining Act can be a fairly blunt instrument and if you don't deliver on promises it can result in, for example, loss of tenure. The other thing that in, in perusing, as one does sometimes, the, uh, 
the court decisions, it's it's not a straightforward relationship between your regulatory approvals and, say, your private agreements, for example, through an Indigenous land use agreement. And there have been some fairly recent uncomfortable decisions where uh, and a, a signatory to an access agreement has then <coughs> objected to, say, the grant of a miscellaneous tenement. And it seems that the, uh, the Warden's Court, at least, says that they're perfectly comfortable with that. And if the parties to the agreement want to hold a dispute in a private capacity, that's their business. But it, it seriously can affect explorers because I would assume, most explorers assume that if you have a, uh, an access agreement, that's that. But it isn't necessarily that simple. I suppose the other part of keeping yourself nice is in your discussions with uh, stakeholders, including um, title claimant groups, I think that just saying yes is a very serious temptation and a very dangerous strategy. I, most of my work uh, involves dealing with people at an early stage of their projects, and for explorers in particular, it is very tempting just to say yes. You know, you want this consideration so that we can get access to your land, yes, we'll do that. And I am now looking at a number of projects that I think, um, you know, putting on my engineering hat, will never be able to be operated because people at an earlier stage just said yes. And I think that the, not only can you resolve the end of the projects that are un, unoperable, I don't think that's a word, but can't be built or operated, I think you also run the risk of being seen as a pushover. Uh, in my you know, experience of dealing with um, all manner of stakeholders, and it's not huge because if I can, I avoid it because I'd rather look at a spreadsheet, but the reality is, is you don't want to look like a pushover. And I think that many stakeholders are quite prepared for a bit of argy-bargy and will respect you more if you are prepared to do the same. Next one is, is there's a whole bunch of stuff, particularly early in a project, that is going to land on your desk, whether you want it or not. And that will, again, will come down to the safety stuff, the environment stuff, the heritage and land tenure. And I think one of the best ways that explorers can add value in projects is, first of all, by having, being prepared to develop some passing familiarity with those aspects of their work, and also by developing constructive relationships with other people in the company framework um, to address those, uh, I guess, peripheral issues, that, the things like the environmental and, and the safety stuff. Uh, I had a, I have my colleague here from Northern Minerals who has been um, helping me a lot on some of the stuff for a rare earths uh, project. We had a situation where we thought we had groundwater contamination. If it hadn't been for the exploration people taking the trouble to very carefully document drilling records, right down to you know how many liters of hammer oil were used every day, by who and what sort. I ended up having to trawl through all the daily drilling records so that I could have uh, what could have been a very uncomfortable discussion with the Department of Environment Regulation. But because the exploration people had been absolutely fastidious in their record keeping, we first of all stayed on the right side of the law and notified ourselves under the relevant legislation. But secondly, we got a decision that we were not a contaminated site because we had the technical information to uh, back up our claim. Uh, another example of where explorers can, I guess, add value by collaborating with non-technical or sort of peripheral professionals, again, this one is a, a Northern Minerals example, there's a strong focus right now on pit lakes at mine closure. Even at the time when you are trying to get your, your permitting up, there is an almost obsessive interest in what the pit lakes are going to be like. We have got to a stage where we're attracting a fair bit of government attention over selenium. Um, and because Mr. Google is freely available, the regulators are now very anxious about selenosis, and we are going to have birds looking absolutely disgusting. And this has the potential to cost the company a lot of money, either in try being forced to backfill pits, which I think is not going to happen, or to do crazy amounts of work and modeling and testing to address the question of selenium. 
fortunately, uh, Northern Minerals has some very astute and communicative um, geologists. And one of the things we have discovered over the last little while is that when you are testing for selenium using ICPMS, there is uh, a potential for positive interference between rare earth elements and selenium. And I think that we are going to be able to find uh, a good way out of this apparent selenium problem by applying some decent science and by talking to our colleagues. So I guess that second aspect of having to deal with um, the, the peripheral issues can sometimes add a huge amount of value to the project because of the information you bring as a geoscientist to the permitting and, and compliance aspects of things. I guess the, the other thing that my experience of dealing with explorers is, is that they don't always have a huge amount of money, but they have amazing abilities in interpreting and analyzing data and in making observations. These pictures are from a very small uh, intending gold miner that I did some work with a couple of years ago, and honest to goodness, I don't think they had much money at all. But they took the trouble, and they were trying to get a, an operation up on a brownfield site, and the geologists took some happy snaps. And I really think that that is one of the things that got our mining proposal over the edge, is because if they'd done, frankly, very little environmental work, but they had these photographs. And we were able to trot ourselves down to the Department of Mines and say, well, we know what we're doing is going to work because here's what it looked like in 1996, and here's what it looked like last year, and we reckon we can do this. So I suppose, for me, not all information has to be in the form of data. And the sort of observations that explorers, and I don't just mean the geologists and the geophysicists, I mean your fieldies even, make really important observations. And they have a privileged view that others are never going to see once it gets up to an operational phase. So I think that that is another thing that explorers can, can bring to add value to a project. Now we have some guys here from independence, and I have to say, um, I think one of the things about being in the early phases of a project is sometimes there are opportunities for more innovation and more risk taking than apply during an operational phase of mine. I, I haven't worked for a very long time in an operational setting and partly I think it's because even at kindergarten I couldn't stay within the lines and when you're in an operating environment, I was a manager safety environment on the mine and honestly you've got to follow all the procedures and stay within all the lines but sometimes when you're in an exploration place, there's a room for a little bit of more creativity. I, I had a little project in Morocco where we were doing some baseline environmental work. And we sorted along and we, we saw some drillers. And they, it seemed to me they must be awfully close to the tenement boundary. And they actually weren't on the tenement of interest to us. But we got talking with them. And I was appropriately retired from Morocco. And, and I was there with my client. And the, the gentleman, the driller, said to me, is that your husband? And I said, no, it's my client. He said, you want a toke? I said, uh, no, thank you. Um, but would you mind if we looked at your core trays? No, no, go for your life, love, he said. So we, we looked at his core trays, we photographed his core trays. I happen to have a bottle here. Would you mind if we took some groundwater samples? No, he says, go for your life. So that information, while it wasn't strictly according to the book, it was awfully close to the tenement boundary and it was really, really helpful when we came to having to do some of the environmental permitting. So one of the things I think that explorers can bring to add value is a little bit of lateral thinking and a preparedness to maybe take a little bit of risk. On the other hand, I think mistakes at the exploration phase can be extremely damaging. Um, I don't know if any of you are aware of a case to do with, there was an intending coal miner in the Kimberley, found themselves in the warden's court. Very unhappy experience. If relationships go bad at the outset, it can be delays, and delays, of course, translates to money. So while there are opportunities for um, lateral thinking, I equally think that mistakes <coughs> up front can color the whole future of the project. And on that tone, I guess that the image you project early on is going to be one that 
uh, will last a long time. The little picture at the bottom is a picture of me on the tenement that is now the Stockland Project tenement. I was doing packer testing in about 1984. I started doing a little bit of other work for independence a couple of years ago, which involved me going back up to site. And to my surprise and horror, people still remembered me from 1984. So <laughs> I guess that's uh, where you end up. And I, I, the final word from an externality perspective on exploring, I was listening to the Swiss pilot Andre Borschberg behind the <coughs> Solar Impulse Project on Radio National last week. And one of the things that captured me about his view is, is when you are doing novel things, you get into the unknown and become an explorer. According to Borschberg, an explorer is not the one who is conquering the world. An explorer is the one who is embracing the unknown. And to me, that sort of captures the difference between maybe the operational world and what explorers bring to projects. I think that as it relates to the dealing with the externalities, it means that it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be all tedium, but the value you bring is really by embracing the unknown and adding to your skill set. And that's me. Thank you, uh, Lisa. Do we have any uh, questions just before we go into the tea break? It's, it's, it's quite terrifying in some ways. I guess the good news is, is I'm not sure how much notice people take of it, but I mean, it, for, for, for the individuals involved, uh, it's, it's quite the, the amount of power there is extraordinary. Uh, I would never underestimate what could happen in a warden's court. Um, yeah, it's, it's very scary. Actually, actually well, I, we, we, we've been talking about whether or not, you know, where these things rank in a, in a quantitative sense. I was doing the due diligence some years ago and there was an environmental consulting group that had been asked to do a uh, a risk assessment for a polymetals mine in the southwest. And they'd, you know, gone through all the matrices and the high, you know, risk and low risk and catastrophic and trivial. And they they looked at the risk that they didn't get the permits granted, which they said properly would be catastrophic. Um, but they thought it was not a particularly high one. And then in writing the report, they averaged up all the risk scores and concluded that on balance, there was only moderate risk associated with the project neglecting the fact that they still thought that there was a, a, a fair risk that they would not get their permits. And I mean, it, I mean, in terms of not grasping even the most basic quantitative methods, they basically said to their client that although they thought there was a middling chance that they wouldn't get a permit, <coughs> overall things were still, on average, things were still fine. So, where do you go with that? <laughs>